guys like that last song? Mm-hmm. Did you guys know Cameron wrote that? Yes. How many of y'all knew that? A couple of y'all? Um, completely off topic, but Cameron is going to be working on an album soon. And um, I think Cameron does a great job leading us in worship and even coming up with original music that I told him a particular song. I was like, man, there's a song I want to play for this this particular passage. And he was like, well, check this out. He sent me the lyrics, and it was just capital Y, yes, exclamation, exclamation. Um, thank you, Cameron, for serving us in that way. Um, man, it's been a weighty year. Um, there's a lot, a lot that's gone on. There's a lot that's going on. Um, I can tell you as a pastor... As a, as a new pastor, that there's a lot of things that I haven't done well. Um, I'm willing to be transparent. Um, a lot of it was ignorance, but we know ignorance is not always the best excuse. But I will say that this week in particular, um, the Lord did something amazing through this passage. And I hope that in the same way the Spirit rocked me through this passage, that he will do the same for you guys. Um, you guys know we've been going through the, this Advent series. It's kind of unique. and I, don't, I think most people end Advent at Christmas. Um, but we wanted to end Advent with uh, the resurrection. Knowing that we would be here for New Year's Eve. Knowing that we'd be celebrating a new year. We thought what, a be- what better way to celebrate the new year for Convergence Church. And each of you individual as Christians. What better message than the message of the resurrection? So initially I was looking at Luke 24 uh, verses 1 through 12. And then I just got to looking at the rest of the, the passage. I noticed there was a reoccurring theme. And we'll get to that in a second. But I want to tell you guys uh, right now why the resurrection of Jesus Christ is important. The first reason is we witness the power of God in the resurrection. To believe in the resurrection is to believe in God. If God exists and he created the universe and has power over it, then he has power to raise the dead. Amen? He is not worthy of our faith and worship if he does not have that power. He alone can claim victory over the grave. 1 Corinthians 15. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is also important because it validates the claims of who Jesus claimed to be, namely the Son of God and the Messiah. His resurrection was a sign from heaven that authenticated his ministry. Another reason of the resurrection and its importance is that it proves Jesus' sinless character and his divine nature. The scripture said in Psalm 16.10 that God's Holy One would never see corruption. And because Jesus never saw corruption, he truly never died. He never remained in the grave. It was on this basis of the resurrection of Christ that Paul preached. Through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. The resurrection of Jesus is not only the supreme validation of his deity, it also validates the Old Testament prophecies. And we'll get more into this as we go. So, In today's passage and the theme of this message, in addition to all the important things I just laid out in the resurrection, today we will focus on how the resurrection deals with our unbelief. And then we will see the result of believing in Jesus and his word. So the main point of this text is the resurrection of Jesus is the fulfillment of scripture which causes glory and joy, which leads to worship and mission, fulfilling all scripture. For you slow riders, I'll say that again. The resurrection of Jesus is the fulfillment of scripture, which causes glory and joy, which leads to worship and mission, fulfilling all scripture. So if you guys aren't familiar with this, I'll go ahead and break down what I saw to be a reoccurring pattern that happened three times in this chapter. The problem was unbelief. 
The solution was Jesus' presence and the scripture. And the result was belief that led to hearts burning with glory and joy leading to mission. And those are kind of be the, the, the framework from which I, I lay out the three points and give you the three examples. The first one is, in verses 1 through 12, Pastor Rick <coughs> likes to call these, these ladies the Spice Girls. It's kind of an old Pastor Rick reference. Some of you guys are like, who are the Spice Girls? So I'm going to read it to us, and then we'll talk about it. In verse 1, Luke chapter 24. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and went to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. And he went home marveling at what had happened. Now, at first glance here, um, when I read this, I was thinking to myself, I always try to put myself in the situation. Like what would it look like if I was the women going to the tomb? And, and at first it was kind of admirable to me that um, it says on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, at early dawn, so early in the morning, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. And so they had spent much time, much talent and treasure preparing these spices for what? For a dead body. Uh, this was part of the embalming or the, the, the spices, you think of the aroma. This was, this was something that would have been done to, to aid a dead body that was decomposing. As I started thinking about that at first, um, I thought, man, that, how admirable of them to wake up early, to, to spend their money, to go and, and spend uh, time preparing these spices, to go on this journey, to go and, and, and basically give their, their last worship to Jesus. But when they got there, verse 2 says, the stone was rolled away. They did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. They were perplexed, ESV says. They were perplexed by this. And then I started, I took a step back and I said, well, hold on a minute. I don't know if this was as admirable as we thought. And the reason why is because of what the angels tell them. Now, pause for a second. Isn't it awesome of God that as these women are looking at this empty tomb and they're sitting there perplexed that God would send angels to give them commentary what's going on? Isn't that awesome that God did that? But what did the angels say to them? So why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here but has risen. Remember how he told you. Jesus told them he wouldn't be there on the third day. Didn't he? He told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. So did the women need to go and prepare their spices and go on their long journey for the dead decomposing body? As history would have it. No, they didn't. And again, they, they were believing in the natural, this, this Jesus that they had been with had died, just like every other man they'd been with died, and, and dead men, when they die, they go into a grave and they stay there. But not Jesus. 
Jesus told them he wouldn't be there. And as the angels spoke these words to them, what happened? They remembered. They remembered his words. So the problem was that they were doing some unnecessary works because they had unbelief, which led them to be perplexed when they saw the empty tomb. What was the solution? God's angelic commentators, what did they give them as the solution? Anybody? Not all at once. Piper, what did, the, what did the angels give them? The words of God. He gave them the very words that Jesus himself spoke. And what happened? They remembered. So their problem, which was unbelief, was solved through the scripture. And what was the result? Verses 8 and 9. And they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the rest. So that's the first, that's the first of three. The second example of problem in this scripture is from verses 13 through 33. On that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, Can Brian take this thing off? Start over. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all of this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels and said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into the glory? enter into his glory. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if they were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us. For it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened. And they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together. So what's the problem with these two guys? Isn't it odd that these two men were coming from Jerusalem they knew the story of Jesus the king, the Messiah they knew the prophecies they even had confirmation from the people in their group who said it was an empty tomb 
Jesus Christ himself. And they still didn't believe. Isn't that crazy? How many of you have ever stopped to wonder, man, wouldn't, wouldn't it be really cool if Jesus was here with us? Like, oh, man, just hang out with Jesus. Maybe, maybe spend some time walking together, talking about the scriptures, or, or let's have a meal with Jesus. <coughs> Anybody ever thought that? Some of us? Well, well, he was doing that. But these dudes didn't even recognize him. You know why? Even though they had all the right words, they had all the right prophecy. They even had all the right eyewitness. They had the wrong Jesus. They wanted a Jesus who was going to redeem Israel. They still did not have understanding of who the right Jesus was. It says they were sad. Now normally this is a, this is a Easter sermon. This is a resurrection Sunday sermon. This is an empty grave. We all get excited. Now these dudes were, were, they were within walking distance of the empty tomb and they were sad. Jesus himself was walking with them and they were sad. They had the wrong Jesus. They wanted a, they wanted a national savior. They were looking at Jesus like some people look at a president now and say, he'll, he, he'll be the one. I think he's sort of a Christian. He'll, 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 he'll put it into abortion. He'll, he'll, he'll give us rights as a Christian. They were looking to Jesus to be this political savior. So what did Jesus do as a solution? I'll give you a hint. It was the same thing as last time. Anybody? What's that? The word of God. The word of God. Now, I hope this doesn't sound blasphemous. You, sh you should probably shouldn't say anything after you begin with the sentence with those words. But I was thinking to myself, Jesus Christ, walking with these two guys, empty tomb, he's with them, and was this not enough? <coughs> was this not enough? It was almost like... Um, if you get pulled over by a cop and they ask you for your ID and you're like, well, you know, I'm James Stanford. And they're saying, yeah, but I need to see your ID. You said, no, well, I'm James Stanford. Maybe you speak Cajun, whatever. You're, I, I've got 14 kids. We live in Summers Walk and you're giving all these details and they said, I need to see your ID. It was almost like Jesus was saying in this moment that his word was his validation. It was his ID. In John 8, 32, he says, you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free. The truth is his word. We got people who spent, they walked with Jesus. Didn't even know it was him. Didn't recognize him until what? Until he opened the word. Did you guys know the whole Bible is about Jesus? Gerhardus Voss says this. Jesus is not just a great expounder of the truth of the Old Testament. Jesus is the great truth to be expounded of the Old Testament. The Old Testament is about Jesus. The Old Testament is about God. Father, forgive us if, if we open the scriptures and read stories of David and Abraham and, and Isaac and, and we put ourselves in that equation saying, wow, we're just like David, man. We got all that we're slinging. No. This was all pointing to Jesus. In Luke 4, what's the first thing Jesus did to start his ministry? He went to the synagogue and what did he do? He opened up the scroll of Isaiah and began reading the word of God. 
This is how he started his ministry. And how does he end it? Same way. You think the word of God is important to God? Man, this is what this is what stirred my heart up this week. You know, as a pastor, it's like, okay, you got these people in this church, these GCGs, these DNAs. Sometimes people don't get along. I'm meeting people at 5 a.m. at Brugger's Bagels. We're driving over to here. We're, we're meeting with people. We get the t-shirts ordered. Like, there's all this stuff going on. What's the most important thing to God? His word. Anybody do art in here? Got some artists in the house? Anybody do abstract art? All right, we got abstract artists. So if, if Owen was going to paint a painting and put it on the wall, and we could all sit here, and it was, if you know what abstract art is, it's kind of, it could be anything from splotches all over to weird <laughs> designs and shapes. And we could all look at it and say, no, I think that looks like an elephant. And the next guy would come in and say, no, man, that's definitely a, a Lego blaster, a Nerf gun. Or the next guy is like, no, that's, I'm pretty sure it's a guy shooting basketball. Right? Abstract art, we get all these different views of what the painting is. In the same way, we think about the Bible, we think about a book, we think about an author. If you want to understand some of the great literary works of our history, Shakespeare, Maya Angelou, different people like that, who would be the best person to consult? The author. Jesus is the author of Scripture. On the road to Emmaus, he's saying, listen, the Scripture interprets itself. I'm teaching you how to interpret the scripture. If you want to understand this scripture, look to me. And by the way, all this, all this scripture is about me. There's a thing in, in, in um, interpretation called hermeneutics. It's the art and science of interpretation. And Jesus has given us the hermeneutic for the Bible. It's called Christocentric hermeneutics. He said, everything in the word is about me. There's three main parts. The law of Moses, Psalms, and the prophets. He says, this is, this is more reliable than trusting in a person who's risen from the dead. You guys remember the story of the rich young ruler? What did he say? Man, if, they'll just, if they'll just send me, if they can just send someone to tell, tell them. Let me, let me go back and tell them. And what did Jesus say? No, man. They had the law and the prophets and they didn't believe. Now, this is no knock on my charismatic friends, but, but people want signs and wonders and all these things to, to believe. The word of God is the testimony of God. There was people that were walking with Jesus that didn't know it was Jesus until he opened up the word of God. How dare us as Christian people think that somehow salvation will come through anything else in the Word of God. Amen? Getting ahead of myself. Way ahead of myself. <laughs> this application is so good. I just want to get right to it. What was, the, what was the result? So the problem was their unbelief, the wrong Jesus. They were sad. The solution was Jesus. Again, okay, Matthew chapter 1. Last week we just went through uh, Emmanuel, God with us. We, we, the Advent, God is with us. Guess what? On the road to Emmaus, he's still with them. Remember what he says in the Great Commission? Behold, I'll be with you till the end of the age. And he, I think it's interesting he's still with these dudes, even sad dudes who don't believe He's still with them, expounding the scriptures. What was the result? A burning heart. A burning heart. That's a bold word. Two words. Or three. A burning heart. That's not somebody who's just filled with a feel-good emotion and 
A burning heart. If you think about the imagery there. A heart that's set on fire. This is what it was like to spend time with Jesus as he expounded his word. What was the result, again, of men with burning heart, a passion for Jesus? What they do? They went and told. Two guys on the road to Emmaus with their heads down low. No hope, empty grave, wrong Jesus. Jesus shows up, opens his word. They have burning heart. They're, they're filled with the Spirit. The Spirit opened their eyes to the things that were necessary. Verse 26, that God would suffer and they'd enter into his glory. Their eyes were open. Their hearts were burning. They went and told. The last group, the disciples, in verses 33b through 53. Follow along with me, please. And they rose the same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Isn't it also interesting that Jesus eats with them? Seems like he's setting up a model for ministry for us. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved, believed for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Then they said to them, Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in the name to all nations. Beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And we're continually in the temple. Blessing God. So keeping with the, the framework of problem, solution, result. The problem we see here in verses 36 through 38. Jesus with them. They were startled and frightened. They doubted and their hearts were troubled. Again, unbelief. The very disciples that he had spent time with doing miraculous deeds, doing miraculous things, he came back to them in the way that he promised he would. And they were afraid. And if we're being honest, we probably would have been too. Right? No one had ever seen anything like this. The dead raised to life. What was the solution? Verses 44 through 47. Let's focus in on verse 46. Jesus said to them, Thus it is written. Thus is the Greek word hutos. It means in this way. Hutos means this is the way or in this way. He's saying this is the only way. This is the way it had to happen. That the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. <coughs> and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Again, the scripture is sufficient to interpret itself. 
by God's grace, we have the 27 books of the New Testament. Right? But the truth is, if we just had the Old Testament, it would still be sufficient for salvation. Because it's pointing us all to Jesus Christ. That's what they had, and that's what he's referring to, along with the words he spoke to them while he was with them. Verse 44. In regards to the words he spoke to them, he said, they must be fulfilled. It's the Greek word day, which means utterly necessary or definite. Jesus in John 10, 35 said the scripture cannot be abolished, but fulfilled. His resurrection had to happen in order to fulfill scripture, in order to fulfill his very own prophecy. It was utterly necessary. It was definite. It was certain. It fulfilled its purpose. What's the result? In verse 48, that they would witness who he was to do what? In verse 49, to be his witnesses. And the beauty of it, in verse 49, he references his promise. And he promised them that he would not leave them alone, but he would give them a helper for this mission. The Holy Spirit. He says, Behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Acts 1 8 says, You will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes, and you will testify who Jesus is from Jerusalem to Samaria to Judea to the ends of the earth, the uttermost parts. He's referencing again Isaiah. There's a fulfillment that takes place in a prophecy in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 3. It says, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted above the hills. And the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. They were fulfilling a prophecy from Isaiah. There's a show on Netflix called The Crown. Uh, season two just came out. It's very, I, I want to say family friendly. I think. For the most part it's a wonderful it's a wonderful kind of docudrama show about um, Queen Elizabeth and her reign in England at the very beginning of the the show my wife loves to skip through the intros but it's, it's showing this this gold metallic infusion of this beautiful crown And I believe that the resurrection is the coronation of our Lord Jesus Christ it, it is the crowning achievement it is the exclamation point on the sentence of his life, his death, and his resurrection. Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. The advent, we talked about the prophecy, the birth, the life, the death, and now the resurrection. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why through him we utter our amen. To the glory of God. We find all our yes and amens in Jesus Christ. We read earlier from Exodus where Moses was looking at the tail end of God's glory.
Moses never got to enter into the promised land. But Moses is the glory of the Lord. We saw in the transfiguration who was with Jesus. Moses. In glory. And here we see the full glory of the Lord. If you read Matthew's account of the resurrection, it's this thunderous scene. An angel sitting on top of the tomb. Victory. Victory over death. No man could ever do that. This is a crowning achievement of all mankind. The God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. The crown was placed on his head as he ascended into glory forever. The future glory. The Bible talks about it. A day when the, there'll be, he'll come back to judge all the living and the dead in full glory. And all of those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ through his life, his death, and his resurrection, you will have the crown of glory. You will be co-heirs. There was only one Queen Elizabeth, right? And she's still alive and she's going to die and they're going to put the crown on someone else's head. And it's all based upon a lineage and a bloodline. But I look around this room and I see, I see men and women of, of different cultures and race and creed and and all kinds of just differences. But yet through the Lord Jesus Christ, we are fully crowned. Fully crowned. And not because we've done anything. Not because I have a great last name or, or a patriarch or, or a kingdom, of earthly kingdom that is something respectable of me, about me or something I've done. It's because of what he's done. What he promised he would do. For thousands of years, they promised he would send his son, a Messiah. Born of a, born of a virgin in a manger. To a family who wasn't even married. Skip over that sometimes. Controversial. The rulers of the day wanted him dead. They'd eventually get their wish 33 years later. As he lived the perfect life and the religious leaders couldn't stand him. The Jesus Christ who was on the road to Emmaus was around all the religious zealots who loved the law but they hated Jesus. So they sentenced him to death. He had an opportunity to be freed. They put him up against Barabbas and said, you pick. You pick which one you want to get crucified. And they said, free Barabbas. The criminal Barabbas was let go so that Jesus might die. And it glorified God to crush his son. There was an earthly and a heavenly transaction happening. The God of all glory was pouring out his wrath on Jesus Christ on the cross. For who? For those of us who were saying, free Barabbas. Those of us who were spitting and mocking Jesus. He went to the cross to die for us. So that what? So that we might become a future glory of God. That we might be a people who have been rocked and changed by this message. That we would go and tell. So here's, here's us. Right? All the Bible's about God, but it leads us to look within. Keeping the framework, Jennifer, of problem, solution, result. Let's look at ourselves. 2017, December 31st. Do we do unnecessary things? Like the, the, the women? Do we kind of toil and spend our time, talents, and treasure doing things that have no real eternal impact because we haven't believed the words of Jesus Christ? How much time are we wasting doing fruitless things? Are we people who have an empty tomb, yet we don't understand the significance and power of that on a daily basis? Like the guys on the road to Emmaus, are, are we looking for God to be our savior of, 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 of earthly means? 
Are we people who cry out to God when the going gets tough? And God, we just need a lifeline. Help us out. I don't like my circumstance. Or do we realize He's with us? Do we realize He's with us? Here's a convicting one. Does His Word burn in your heart? Does His Word burn in your heart? This one brought me to my knees this week. So I searched the Scriptures and I saw these guys who were just, their bosom was on fire because of God's Word. And I was like, man, I've had moments of that. But I don't feel like that now. I feel like that right now, <laughs> truthfully. Does your heart burn for the Lord and His Word? Having beheld the glorious risen Christ like the disciples, are we people who are marked with continual praise? Continual. Continual blessing the name of our Lord. Maybe you're not. What's the solution? What's the solution of this whole story? The Word of God. Jesus said in John chapter 15 that those who abide in Him will bear much fruit. <coughs> and apart from Him we can do nothing. You know how I know that? This is in here. The Bible says, He who knew no sin became sin so that I might become the righteousness of Christ. Do you know how I know that? Because it's in here. I got a phone call this weekend from um, a young man who uh, was con considered suicide. And um, right away, I just said, listen, man, I don't know your story, but I know what the Bible says. I walk him through the problem of sin, because it's in here. I walk him through the solution of sin, Jesus Christ, because it's in here. I walk him through the future glory that he has, because it's in here. So the solution for people whose heart is not on fire for the Lord, the people who are doing useless things in the name of the Lord, right? Let's, let's back up a minute in verse 1. These women, by all estimation, people would think they're doing good, godly things. I mean, how many of y'all read that verse and were like, that's, that's pretty, yeah, that's pretty uh, respectable. No. God doesn't, He doesn't want us bringing uh, ointment to an empty tomb there's not the tomb's empty he's risen from the dead raise your hand if you've seen it. Jesus risen from the dead but guess what we've been saved through the spirit through his word this is the miraculous work of God So my question for you guys what is influencing you about God and how are you helping influence others about God? Now I'll, I'll share my testimony with you in a heartbeat because I can't deny what God has done in my life. But people don't get saved through my testimony they get saved through the word of God. We're talking about being a church on mission. We want to go reach people, the least of these. If we're going to go pat people on the back and, and 
and give them a Bojangles gift card and not give them the word of God, Lord, strike us down. Because people don't need a chicken dinner. People need the word of God. Now, we can study the word of God while we're eating chicken dinner with them. But they need the word of God. So, Convergence Church. Hopefully, some of you are convicted. I was as I read this. As I thought about the word of God and its, its, its purpose in Jesus' ministry. And how dare any of us think that we can somehow do ministry better than Jesus. Right? Um, we are we're going to do a 2018 reading plan. It's called the Discipleship Journal. And... Our brother Ryan has printed out some, some sheets that have the reading plan on them. I'll set them right here by the Lord's Supper. You'll grab them. There's 30 of them. If you have a phone, you can download on your phone the Version reading plan. All right? Now, the last thing I want to be is a legalist. Say, oh, you got to do this, and if not, and you're not a Christian, and how dare you? No, 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 no. But what I'm here to tell you is that the most important thing I can give you as a, as a pastor of this church, as a friend, as a dad, and as a husband, is the Word of God. Period. Exclamation point. So, I would love to commit to do this together. I need accountability. Reading the Word of God, I'll just admit I struggle at times. This is a great reading plan. That's the reason we chose it. And there's 25 days of the month with reading. And then if there's extra days in the month, so for instance, if there's 31 days in the month, you get six days of catch-up, meditation, rewinding back, dwelling on things you've, you've seen. But there's 25 days every month. And you go through the whole Bible in a year. So I'm even confessing, I've never even gone through the Bible in a year. Anybody else? Jay, everybody else, super holy. Praise God. Y'all can hold us accountable. I've read through probably the whole Bible, I, I hope. But I've, I've, I've started these plans and never really stuck with them. So um, I want to end this sermon with the words of Paul from Ephesians chapter 1. And then I'm going to do something a little unique. We're going to pray together. But let me read this to you guys. This is what Paul says to the church in Ephesus. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him through his word having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the work of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That's my prayer for us as a church. And what I want to do is, if you guys will indulge me on this, I want to, um, I want to circle up as best we can and hold hands. And... I want to do that as a, as a symbol, as a gesture that we are unified and not saying you have to be committed to this particular reading plan, but we are committed to God's word in this church. And it will take authority in our life. And it will transform us. It will be the single thing that, that rules and reigns in our life. And the power contained within. So if we could just
So we're, th there's nothing mystical about this circle that will, will impart in us any great wisdom or knowledge that will make us read our Bibles, but this is, guys, we're, we're saved through the gospel of Jesus Christ through the Spirit of God, which is enlightened and spoke all the scriptures into existence that preserved for us for thousands of years and will, will last forever. So... Um, I just want everybody to take a look around at, at some of the faces here of this, of this church. And, and I'd like, I would like to, I, I would invite you guys to hold me accountable as one of your pastors to be in the Word. And I, I would hope that you guys would feel the same way about yourself. Does anyone want to give a, a word about the Word? Can we pray? Thank you for your word and that you have spoken to us and you've reminded us of the power of resurrection of Jesus Christ and the hope that we have because of that and, and that you've reminded us of uh, the power of your word, God, that we need it desperately. And Lord, I ask that you would uh, that you would ignite in us a fire, Lord, that we would be a church that is guided by your word, that is hungry for your word that pursues and submits to your word before anything else, God. Lord, let us be ruled by your word. Let us love your word. And God, I just confess to you, Lord, that, that I am often distracted by other things. And that, I, that I put other things above your word, God. And Lord, I don't want to be that way. But Lord, I, I ask that you would be faithful to continue doing a work in me, that you would renew my desires, Lord. God, we confess that we don't even have the ability to want to do the right thing. So Lord, we ask that you would stir up in us desires of your heart, Lord. Would you replace our old fleshly desires with your desire. Give us your heart. And Lord, I do ask that you would uh, that you would give us humility, that we would submit to one another, and that we would be bold to speak into each other's lives and ask and question and dig and, and make sure that we are that we are following you, that we are pursuing you, Lord. Help us to sharpen one another for your glory. That we would draw close to you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hey.